In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the fourth Sunday of the month of Toba, and we read in this Sunday the scripture reading that we read on the sixth Sunday of the Great Fast, which is the reading of the man born blind. And in this story, we know that the Lord and his disciples were, were walking, and they saw this man who was blind from birth. Uh, and then the disciples asked the Lord, who is it that sinned? that this man would be born blind was it this man or was his parents was this blindness due to some kind of sin and the lord responded and he said neither this man nor his parents sinned because the work uh, b- uh, but that the works of god should be revealed in him meaning that through this man the works of god were be to w- were, were to be revealed and so even though this man was physically blind, and yet well, by the end of the story, he saw like something new. He saw something that actually many other people alive at that time did not see, which was the glory of God. And he then became a worshiper of him and a follower of Christ. But by the end of the story, the Pharisees who had heard about this miracle that the Lord had done, when they came to the, to, to the scene and they questioned all of the people, they questioned the man, they questioned his parents, and yet they refused to believe and accept that this man actually was healed because they, they did not accept the authority of Christ. They were threatened by him. They didn't want to believe that he had actually done this miracle to, <coughs> to make this man see who had been born blind. So even though at the beginning you have a blind man, by the end of the story he is the one who truly sees clearly and has the right perspective, whereas the Pharisees who are able to see And they should be the ones who understand these things as the religious leaders of the people. And yet they were the ones who were blinded. And so the blind man saw the glory of God and believed in Christ, but the Pharisees um, could not. So we can actually consider, we as believers or as human beings, (coughs) it's easy for us to become spiritually blind for one way or the other. Um, How do we see our life and how do we see our place in it? When, when we are rebuked or when we receive messages of either encouragement or seeing the work of the Holy Spirit or, or a conviction by God that we should walk in a different direction in our life or how to choose wisely in making wise decisions, are we able to perceive the work of God in our lives? Are we able to experience his presence with us? Um, in Romans 11.8, it says, Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day so there are people who live a life as though they are blind that maybe in front of them there's all kinds of evidence of the existence of god maybe in front of them they are experiencing a calling by god and through the work of the holy spirit for them to repent for them to change their direction of life for them to go in a different path for them to serve one another for them to give up a life of sin and yet in their blindness they continue to walk in the path that they have chosen and rejecting all of these attempts that the lord is making to reach them so we can ask the question what are some reasons that we do not see the glory of the lord the lord said the reason why this man was born blind is so that the glory of god would be manifested in him and yet here are the pharisees that see the miracle and 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 know that this was the man indeed who was blind and yet they do not see the glory of the lord why is it that they did not see the glory of the lord even though this was the intention of why even that this man was born blind to begin with and to be healed at this time so we can ask in general what are some reasons that we do not see the glory of god the first reason we can give is because of sin someone who is living in a life of sin is unable to see the work of god in their lives and unable to see the work of god around them this is why many times people who are atheists who believe that the reason that they reject the existence of God is because there is no logical reason to believe, there is no evidence to believe, and they try to bring all of these reasons to refute the possible existence of God. But maybe the issue is not so much the issue of the mind, but an issue of the lifestyle that they choose to live. And I do not want there to be a sovereign God who then commands me, who then I have to submit my will to him, who then tells me what is the moral standard that I need to live by, And so I reject his existence because I feel like it encroaches on my freedom, it encroaches on my will, it encroaches on the life that I want to live. And so I choose to continue to live in sin and I do not accept the idea that God even could exist. Or that even though, as we said before, God is trying to reach us and yet because we are so um, attached to sin and 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 the uh, life and the desires of the flesh that we do not um, we don't realize we don't hear his voice speaking to us. In Ephesians 4:19 it says, 
who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness. Meaning these people have given themselves completely to a life of sin, uh, completely to worshipping their own senses, to worshipping their own lusts, that everything that they do is in order to satisfy themselves, that for them this has become God. Their flesh is their God. The, do the desires of their flesh, the desires of the things that they choose to do and how they choose to live has become God for them. And so they worship no other God. They reject the concept of any other God. And so they do not see his glory. They do not see his presence. The, even if a miracle were to happen in front of them, this would not be sufficient for them to believe because they are, do not desire him. They desire only to live um, for themselves. So that's one reason why maybe someone would not see the glory of God. Another reason is because of distraction, the distraction that is in the world. Um, even if someone is not living an active uh, sinful life, but maybe they are just so immersed in all of the different activities that we have to do in the world that we're unable to see anything outside of this. Each of us has um, to-do lists and we have many responsibilities and we have other people that we are responsible for and we have um, things that we have to do for our own career or for our own finances or for our own families or whatever the case might be. We have many, many things in our minds that we need to be working on and that we need to be doing. And it's very easy for us to begin to focus on these things more than we focus on our spiritual life. Spiritual life is one of those things that doesn't ever feel urgent. There's, there's rarely a feeling of urgency when it comes to spirituality. Whereas on the day-to-day -day activities that we are called to do, there, sense, there tends to be a sense of urgency. Like there's certain deadlines that I have, that I have to meet, that I have to finish. And, and if I don't, there is immediate consequences if I don't. But when it comes to the spiritual life, it's easy for us to keep putting it off, putting it off, because there isn't an immediate urgency or an immediate deadline or an immediate consequence whenever someone misses or doesn't do these spiritual activities. But we know that these things, they, the effect that they have on us is over time. Over a long period of time, they begin to affect me. You know, as someone who is malnourished for a long period of time, they begin to have diseases that manifest in them. They begin to be sick. That maybe from one day or two days or one week, it's, you're not going to see it, but over a long period of time, you begin to see these diseases. And so distraction by the world is one of the main reasons why people do not see the work of God in them. Maybe God is even speaking to us and we don't hear him because we are so busy, so busy with so many preoccupations. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Meaning, use your time wisely. How is it that we would divide our time? How much of our time do we give to God versus giving to other things? Also, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, it says, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober meaning be alert and watchful. Do not be just sleeping when it's speaking about the spiritual sleep. The, do not just be like uh, incapacitated spiritually, focusing only on the worldly things. Be sober, be awake, so that when it is time of the, for the Lord, when it's time for spiritual activities, then we, are, we rise up and we do them. This is why the church arranges for us different seasons and different schedules for us to bring God into our life on a daily basis. We should have a spiritual canon where we pray to God on a daily basis. We have uh, the canon where we come to church once a week. We have different fasting seasons. We have <coughs> different uh, opportunities for us to grow closer to God that even while we live in the world and we have all of these responsibilities and things that we have to do, we are still able to be with God in the midst of it. Um, <coughs> being very busy as well, <coughs> um, a good example of this story is Mary and Martha. And here I want to emphasize specifically the idea of being busy even while in, in the service. Because sometimes even those of us who are very preoccupied by what we would consider to be with um, Christian service, we would, we would, you know, someone who is coming to the church and has a service that they have to perform, and we would say, this is good, we are offering the service to God. But even in the midst of performing such a service, there is a certain boundary between the life of worship and the life of service. The life of service cannot replace or take the place of the life of worship. Meaning what? In the story of Mary and Martha, both Mary and Martha loved Jesus, and Jesus was with them in their home. Mary, 
seeing and knowing how precious this time was that she sat and did nothing but listen to him. She sat at his feet, she listened to him, she wanted to be with him. Whereas Martha was in the kitchen preparing and there was nothing wrong with what Martha was doing because actually it was necessary for her to prepare and to do the things she was doing. She was the responsible one, if you want to say that. But it was the timing. The time that she chose was the wrong time. The time that she chose where instead of spending this precious time with Christ, she chose to do things that one would call service, but it wasn't service at the appropriate time. And so part of <coughs> being distracted and being busy means that maybe all of these things that we are called to do, yes, we have to do them. They are not optional. We have many responsibilities. But the question is, is when is the appropriate time to do each thing? For instance, when the Lord established the Sabbath, he said, on the Sabbath day, you shall do no work. You have six days of work, but on the Sabbath day, there is no work. So we, he allocated for them a time for the spiritual renewal. And he said, there is a time for all things. He didn't say it's sinful to work. It, he didn't say that all those other responsibilities that you have are irrelevant. He says, you have to find a balance between the, the actions, the things that you have to do in the world that are necessary and, and the time that we commit and we, we dedicate to God. And this is what we learn from the story of Mary and Martha. Both Mary and Martha were doing a good thing, but what Martha was doing was at the wrong time. And so this is a, something that the Lord pointed out. And so she, would, she missed out on the benefit of being with Christ. Imagine if you had the opportunity to be with the Lord Jesus Christ who would come to your house and you would sit there with him and listen to him. What is it that he has to say to you? What, what like precious time would that be? We wouldn't want to uh, miss that time by doing anything else. We, right? we wouldn't want to miss that for any reason, no matter how other thing, even if we are doing something for him, like preparing something for him. This is why actually when I come and visit anyone in their home, I tell people, please do not make me any food. I just want to sit with you. Like, because I know people out of their zeal and their desire and their love to want to give good things, they might go and prepare many things. But actually the time that I have for with each person is limited. And so I would rather just spend it with the, with the family, with the people, rather than um, for you to spend a lot of time preparing something that's just going to distract from, from that time that we have together. It's the same principle. Um, another reason that maybe we do not see the glory of God is because of a lack of consistency. You know, it's very easy to do something good once, right? Um, many of us have experienced, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a sudden zeal, a sudden desire to do good, a sudden desire. Maybe we listen to a sermon or we see the example of a person. We say, I want to be like this person. I want to serve like this person. I want to pray like this person. We read the stories of the saints and we feel motivated to be like them. We watch a movie about a saint and we're like, yes, this life, this is the life that I want for myself. We go to the monastery and we're like, I want a brand new life. I'm going to live like the monks now and I'm going to pray as much as they pray and I'm going to do all these things and we feel motivated and rejuvenated and of course it's good to have those moments of rejuvenation and renewal and to feel committed and to feel the zeal but we also have to be consistent and realistic because if I just have a momentary feeling of zeal and I have one day of a very strong you know s spiritual activity but then the next day or the next day after that or the next week after that it kind of all fizzles away then what is it that I have really gained have I gained anything Whatever it is that I sought to start to do, it fizzled out very quickly and I did not benefit from it. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be immovable, be steadfast. And whatever it is that we do in our life, be doing it consistently. And it is in the consistency with Christ that we begin to experience his glory. It is in the consistency with him that we find him and that we know him it is not just through a single action it is a life that we choose for ourselves a discipline that we choose for ourselves one reason people do not see the glory of god is because they are not consistent in their life another reason is lack of forgiveness if we have if you if you understand that the the, the body of christ we we make up the body of christ we are the body of christ and so if the body of Christ is in enmity with one another, how is it that can we can experience Christ? If we are his body, if we are his body and we are in enmity with one another, if we are in conflict with one another, if we have lack of forgiveness with one another, how will I experience the peace of God in me? How will I see the glory of God working in my life when I am consider myself to be enemies of other people who are also in the body of Christ. Even if I read the Bible, even if I pray, even if I do these things, but I, but I harbor in my heart uh, a hatred 
for certain people that I am unable to forgive them, then my relationship with God is going to be hindered. So if I don't forgive others, how is it even that God would forgive me? As we as we pray, as as the Lord taught us to pray, that we would for, that we that we are asking God to forgive us our trespasses, just as we forgive the the, the sins and the trespasses of, of one another. We forgive one another, and we want God also to forgive us. So if we are not reconciled with each other, how is it can we be can we can be reconciled with God? And this is something very important for us. Sometimes people separate the you know, the spiritual life, meaning my relationship with God, from my relationship with other people. But actually, God made it very clear that these two are, are, are united as, two, as two, two sides of the same thing. Even in the Ten Commandments, we have some commandments that are directed toward our relationship with God and some commandments directed toward our relationship with one another. And unless we have both of these things in harmony, then there is something missing and there is something that will be lacking in us that we will not experience the fullness of what God wants us to experience because of our, our, our lack of, of love or our lack of forgiveness for other people. Another reason is pride. Pride is when I when I set my own will up higher than the will of others. When I when I when I consider myself to be um, better than others or even better than God, knowing better than Him, knowing what is best for me more than Him, we see this definitely in the Pharisees because the Pharisees spent their whole life trying to show the people that they were the ones who were righteous, that everyone needs to follow after them, and that, and that no one else was worthy of following, even the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When the Lord came, they, they constantly tried to make him out to be a sinner. They tried to make him to be someone who was uh, using the power of Satan to cast out demons. They tried to discredit him in every possible way. Instead of considering that I am the one who is sick, I am the one who needs his ministry and his salvation that he is offering me because I am unable to, 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 to save myself, right? So the Pharisees suffered with this. Even though you wouldn't say that they lived a life of immorality, just like the, 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 the thieves and the tax collectors and the, and, and the harlots, you, they didn't have these types of sins. But the type of sin that they had was maybe even a deeper, more, more foundational sin, which is the sin of pride. And they believed that they were not in need of any correction or any rebuke or even salvation at all. Just their status as being the children of Abraham was sufficient. And so they did not see the work of Christ. Christ was there doing miracles. Christ was there doing all these things preaching and yet even though they heard all of it and yet they did not listen and they did not believe you know sometimes people today ask the question like you know like like we have all of these bible uh, bible translations by you know in every language in the world we have all kinds of sermons that are available we have all kinds of resources that are available and yet people still do not believe how much more when the lord christ himself is present doing miracles and preaching and doing these things and people do not believe if they would not believe this then they would not believe anything at all finally the the main message that we are trying to get from this reading and in our understanding of it is God performed a great work for this man and that he prepared this man from the very beginning of his life to demonstrate the glory of God that was the whole purpose that was the whole purpose of his, of his illness, of his blindness. That is what the Lord said. He said he is blind so that the glory of God could be manifested in him. So that this event that we read about today, everyone could see it and all would believe. You know, as, as much as suffering as this man experienced in his life, he experienced it all so for this moment. This was the, the, the kind of the, 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 the fruition of all, of all of the years of suffering that he had experienced his life from the moment that he was born until now. You ask, why is it that I was blind all of this time? You're blind so that the Lord could be glorified in this exact moment that we read about today. And the purpose of that, of course, it is to benefit the man himself because obviously he, he became a believer afterward, but it is also for the benefit of all of us. Because we are all reading the story even thousands of years later. And of course, all the people at the time that heard about it, they should have all turned and glorified God for the sake of what is it that the Lord had done. 
But when we look deeper in ourselves, we find that maybe there are many reasons that even God's work in front of us is very clear, that is very obvious, that is very abundant. It's not that God is stingy with his blessings, stingy with his love, stingy with the way he shows us mercy, stingy with the way that he gives us blessings in f the form of whether physical blessings or relationships or, or all the desires of our heart that he showers upon us all the time. And yet, even while we see all of these things in front of us, maybe our hearts are still hard. Maybe we are still not perceiving the magnitude of his mercy, the magnitude of his blessing, the magnitude of his love. And maybe the number one thing that, you know, because we can say, well, God doesn't give everyone an easy life for sure. But there is one thing that Christ gave to all of us that is without question and that is, that is you know, immovable in terms of like, like the, the blessing that he offers us, which is salvation. He grants us this gift of salvation, which cannot be uh, understated, which, which, which is, goes far and above what even we deserve at all. So even if the thing that we focus on alone is just the salvation that God has offered us, in this we should see the glory of God. Whenever we question, does God love me? I look to the incarnation. I look to the crucifixion. That is the answer to the question. I look to the fact that I don't have to be afraid of death that I can live my entire life, whatever type of life that is here, whatever, however suffering that I experience here, but there is an end to it. And that the beginning of the life that starts at that point is a life that is filled with nothing but joy and peace and, and for eternity, for eternity. This is, we see the manifestation of God's glory and we should believe and trust and have hope in this promise that God has given us. And in this, we see him working. We see him working in our lives. But the, the reasons we discussed today are reasons why even if God is doing all these things, and of course he has offered all of us salvation, that even while we are hearing the good news of salvation, even while we are looking at his crucifixion, even while we are reading his word, we still feel unmoved. We still feel distant and cold and unable to perceive really what he has done. Maybe we can examine ourselves and see if any of these things we've discussed today is something that affects me. Maybe that is the reason I do not see the, 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 the works of God in, in my life. So may God grant us to open our eyes and not to be blind anymore like this man whom Christ healed so that we can see him clearly, see him in our life and perceive his love for us. And glory be to God forever. Amen.